anger and emotion spilled over like never before one year ago at the Texas State Capitol. I'm here to protect life. I'm here because I believe in women's rights. A standoff over a bill severely limiting abortions drew worldwide attention and sparked a new debate over women's health here at home. House Bill 2 is finally passed. Some here today will believe that this fight has been waged and won. Now we go inside one of the few clinics still open in the aftermath of lawmakers' decisions, and our legislative roundtable breaks down the impact the law has made since that moment, plus the political fallout from the race for governor to the end of an era. Good morning, thank you for joining us for a special edition of State of Texas In Depth. I'm Josh Hinkle, and today we come to you from outside the upper chamber of the legislature, the Texas Senate. One year ago, right here, perhaps the loudest political fight in the state's history, the gallery was packed and all eyes were on one woman standing on the Senate floor. Please accept this copy of my testimony. Democratic Senator Wendy Davis of Fort Worth stood for 11 hours, filibustering a Republican-backed bill that would bring some of the toughest restrictions on abortion in the nation. Overwhelming to see how many people have been willing to be civically engaged in a way that is respectful of civil discourse, but also in a way that says we demand to be heard. Her efforts ran up the clock well into the evening and arguments over Senate rules took up the remainder of the time. Lawmakers missed the midnight deadline to take a vote, but Governor Rick Perry, who initially told the legislature to tackle this issue, called them back the very next day. And within a few weeks, the bill was back on the floor and passed this time, signed into law soon after. It is our responsibility and duty to give voice to the unborn, the individuals whose survival is at stake. What a change that signature made. Take a look. In 2011, 46 Texas clinics provided abortions. Once the law takes full effect this September, most predict there will be just six left, and they will be in the biggest cities, one in Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and San Antonio each, and two in Houston, meaning many women would have to travel hundreds of miles and several hours to get an abortion. One University of Texas study shows 80% of the state's population lives outside those metro areas. Women's rights groups say that lawmakers designed the measure to put abortion clinics out of business. Supporters of the legislation say it's only about protecting the life of a woman and a child. How? Here's a breakdown of the bill. It bans abortions after 20 weeks, the time when many believe a fetus first feels pain. Critics say there is no scientific research to back that up. All doctors performing abortions must have hospital privileges within 30 miles of the clinic, a severe restriction in rural areas. Plus, it's not a requirement for hospitals. Only a doctor may administer abortion-inducing drugs with protocols approved by the FDA, and perhaps the most challenging and certainly costliest part for clinics, they must all have an ambulatory surgical center. When you walk into the Whole Woman's Health Clinic in San Antonio, it's just like you're in the operating room at a hospital. Be able to transfer somebody back to their recovery area. The doors are wide enough for a stretcher to roll through. The spaces are much bigger. And there is even a docking bay for an ambulance. The reasons why this site will be one of just six clinics left performing abortions in the state. It's a sterile environment. But Andrea Ferrigno um, says early term abortions room. often require only the medical abortion pill. It's a very, very simple procedure. It could be completely offered in a consultation office in, um, in a counseling room. Ferrigno, who helps lead this statewide health group, says they had to close down most of their clinics, including the one in Austin. It had smaller exam rooms and recliners in the recovery area. The San Antonio site was already an ambulatory surgical center, what the new law requires, no matter the type of abortion. And it can be expensive to maintain. You have to include the cost of supplies, staffing, uh, physical plant and uh, it increases to the thousands of dollars. For each woman the clinic serves. Most are low income and Ferrigno says Whole Woman's Health often helps them pay for the services, but it will be tough in the future. We are expecting to um, see an increase in patients that will be traveling great distances to access the services they need. Again, that clinic is one of just six that will still be open once every part of the law is in effect, though there is word a few more might be able to open by then. Critics say closing any clinic won't actually protect women's health, but instead hurt it. 
Most offer a wide range of help, often for low-income patients, like cancer screenings, birth control, STD testing, and other health services. But even before those clinics closed, the number of abortions in Texas was already dropping. The state's own figures show more than 81,000 in 2008. Three years later, it was just under 73,000, likely in part because of earlier legislation like cuts to family planning funding. Decisions made right here by your elected officials. Coming up, a closer look back at that now famous filibuster. An update on the law's implementation and the effect it could have in the next election when this special edition of State of Texas In-Depth returns. Mike Ward of the Houston Chronicle. In 25 years covering the legislature here in Texas, I've seen fist fights, I've seen shoving matches. This was probably the top of anything I've seen. I saw House and a few Senate members clasping arms, celebrating the fact that the bill had been killed. Senators screaming, trying to get the vote tallied before midnight. I thought to myself, this is history. Welcome back to State of Texas In-Depth. Security swarmed this chamber and the sound from hundreds in the gallery and thousands just outside these doors often drowned out the debate. Here's a look back. Senator Davis, you, yesterday you gave me a sheet indicating that it was your intention to filibuster. Yes, Mr. President, I You're recognized. In, intend to speak for an extended period of time on the bill. A 13-hour goal on her feet, reading the words of Texas women. From Peggy in Austin, Texas. A filibuster was Senator Wendy Davis' last resort. To decide to stand up for 13 hours and talk on your feet, just going and going and going. Democrats tried to kill the abortion bill in the final days of the special session with no luck. It's not fair, it's oppressive, it's just not right. Hundreds waited to watch the show. We just drove in from Houston, so we got here as fast as we could. Whether they liked it or not. It's not going to keep people like me from coming in here and talking against abortions. It's like watching our own child on the railroad tracks as a train is coming in slow motion. Time ticking away. Right now we're eating and we're going to switch shifts with somebody else um, so that they can go eat. Not a luxury for Davis. No dinner stops, no bathroom breaks. Only talking, talking, and more talking. I would hate to see other families denied the right to choose what is best for them. There's still just under two hours left in a special session. There goes the booze out here. The word is traveling out. The filibuster has been killed. So we'll wait to see what happens if this abortion bill will actually have any chance. We're going to actually walk up one flight because guards will not let us get past that area right now. They brought in extra security with DPS. So. Uh, Juan Rodriguez is our camera guy, and he is actually following me up to the next floor where you can see things are just as crowded up here. Some women actually chained themselves to the railing, and they were waiting there until the troopers actually came over with bolt cutters to get them off of the railing. Then they physically picked them up and took them out the door as the women were all singing, give peace a chance. People know that this bill is going to fail and they are not happy about it. You can see thousands of people are here right now inside the rotunda. They are chanting anytime they see anyone coming out of the chamber. They are booing them as well. Now, right now, we want to come back over toward the chamber so we can show you that people are still lining up to get into the gallery. We've also seen troopers getting ready in riot gear. Uh, beyond that, uh, they're just still taking people through security checkpoints right here, trying to make sure that nothing is in these bags. We've had uh, so far reports of anything in bags that could be actually thrown over the railing. They're taken out. We've got uh, glitter, you have water bottles, you have magazines, you have uh, even suspected jars of suspected uh, urine, feces, paint, uh, you know, so it's a very, very tense situation here right now, and security is d definitely beefed up. You know, at one point I saw more than 50 troopers inside the chamber and the lieutenant governor has threatened to actually clear the entire gallery if things do not calm down and if anything goes forward to prevent this vote. The hallway outside the Texas State Senate seemed almost like the backstage of a rock concert after the special session. Today was democracy in action. Senator Wendy Davis ended her night with supporters. 
from Peggy in Austin, Texas. After more than 11 hours of talking and standing nonstop. Please accept this copy of my testimony. To run up the clock and kill the abortion bill. Tonight was pretty unprecedented. Uh, tonight, in many ways, was historical. Certainly one to watch. Republicans cut Davis' filibuster short, just shy of midnight, the deadline they needed to meet for a vote. Probably the worst night that I've experienced since I've been in the Senate. Democrats worked to keep time ticking. The rules were ignored, uh, and the whole process was rigged. But hit roadblocks in the final minutes. At what point? Must a female senator raise her hand or her voice to be recognized over the male colleagues in the room? The thousands of Davis supporters took over. Troopers had to force several out of the chamber. You missed a hell of a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did everything they could, including, you know, getting the crowd to chant. I mean, you had House members, House members. Democrat House members revving up the crowd, trying to drown us out so we couldn't do our business. That's not the way democracy works. The vote came and went, a little too late to count, thanks to what some are now calling the people's filibuster, and of course, their chosen rock star. My back hurts, <laughs> and I don't have a whole lot of words left in my vocabulary after all that talking, but I am overwhelmed, honestly, by the thousands of people. Just a few weeks after the filibuster, in a second special session, Republicans were successful, passing the bill in mid-July last year. But it has had several legal hurdles along the way, so far coming out on top. Most recently, in March, a federal court upheld the remaining parts that were still challenged, but a new lawsuit is now in play. If nothing changes, though, the law will be in full effect this September. Shortly after passage, I spoke with Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott. The Republican's office has been in charge of defending the law along the way. I do think that the uh, United States Supreme Court, which is where this case probably will wind up, uh, can reconcile both Roe versus Wade and this law. That fight has been a conservative highlight of Abbott's campaign for governor. And not surprisingly, his opponent is none other than the woman that filibuster boosted to Democratic stardom, Senator Wendy Davis. While many politicos consider Abbott the heir apparent, Davis has helped reignite her party tremendously. Democrats have not won a statewide office in Texas in two decades. Vying for the state's second highest post, two other familiar faces from that night, Democratic Senator Leticia Vandepute and Republican Senator Dan Patrick. While the abortion issue helped catapult some careers, it helped harm others, like the leader of this chamber. Coming up, we'll hear from Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst. But first, our lawmaker roundtable. She's a former nurse, he's a doctor. Texas House members from different sides of the aisle, both offering insight on the impact of this health legislation. When this special edition of State of Texas In Depth returns. Aronson from the Texas Tribune. Women in the Rio Grande Valley don't really have access to abortion services right now or many family planning clinics. They must travel to San Antonio or Corpus Christi to get access to those facilities. As a result, researchers have said that they do see a higher rate of women in that area of the state seeking um, illegal drug-induced abortions. Welcome back to State of Texas In-Depth. A year ago, lawmakers battled over an abortion bill inside. Here on the south steps of the state capitol outside, a massive crowd had gathered by midnight. For the filibuster, time was up. Democrats had won temporarily, and they also had a new star, now their nominee for governor. Here to talk about that night and the aftermath for women's health, two people on the front line during the legislative session. Representative Donna Howard is an Austin Democrat and former nurse, and Representative John Zerwas is a Houston area Republican and also a doctor in his home district. Welcome to both of you, thank you for joining us. Back in 2011, there were some cuts to family planning and women's health. Some of that money was restored in 2013, but was it enough from what you've seen in the year since last year's session? Well, both Dr. Zerwas and I are on appropriations and worked on that, and I, I feel very uh, proud of the work we were able to do to restore funds. Um, certainly, the cuts that were made were unprecedented uh, the session before and resulted in the closure of what looks to have been over 70 clinics. So. Restoring funds was critical to try to get those services 
uh, available for, for women. Uh, the, the difference I think I would say is that we restored the funds to some different programs that aren't necessarily as uh, cost effective and we're not currently seeing the number of clients that we saw before the cuts. I mean, yeah, I think what, what we have seen is, uh, Representative Howard's correct, we, 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 we actually restored more than what we cut in 2011. Uh, and I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, we, we needed to really make sure that these services were available to women who fall into the various income levels. Uh, what we have is, is a multitude of programs, actually. Uh, some are, are lesser funded, uh, some are federally funded primarily. Uh, but they're all focused on, you know, improving the health of women and hopefully improving outcomes of, uh, of newborns and things of that nature. Um, I'm most pleased uh, with, I think, at least the, the funding of the primary care uh, program that we put in place that uh, where the, the, the commission came and asked for 60, 70 million dollars to do this. We actually said, no, we want you to take it a step farther. We want this to be a robust program. We want you to spend $100 million on this. So I think we're yet to see, are we in fact meeting the needs? Do we in fact have an adequate network in place? I'm encouraged by the numbers I see uh, in terms of network adequacy and of access. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we've got to be sure that, that the women are in fact uh, getting, getting the services that we have put in place. Um, partly to recover from the 2011 cuts, but partly really to move the ball forward. Because the population is obviously growing. The Center for Public Policy Priorities says that now the majority of impoverished households in Texas are led by women, and we know that more than a half million girls under 18 don't have health insurance. How do you keep up with that next session? Uh, the fact is we've seen here locally in Central Texas the closure of the Lone Star Circle of Care clinics, and that shows you how fragile our provider system can be because that's now having ripple effects on what's happening here in Austin. Uh, and what we thought were going to be uh, providers that would be available to some of these women are not going to be available. So we took a system that was working and we defunded it in order to prevent one of our qualified providers from participating. And in return, even though we put money back in and more, as Dr. Zerwa says, we're putting it in out there in a different way that is, is less cost effective and I'm not convinced that we have the, the providers at this point. So I think that is critical, especially in light of what you bring up, that we have so many women who are not insured and need this kind of, of care. With regard to the abortion clinics that have had to close since the, uh, the, the bill that went through in 2013, Many of those clinics you know, offer other services beyond abortions, HPV screenings, STD screenings. Uh, do you feel like that the legislature might consider funding those clinics if they don't do abortions? There clearly is a very bright line on the issue related to abortion and it was manifest during the last session and special sessions thereafter. And so, you know, I think that clearly what, what the state is interested in, and, and Representative Howard has mentioned, how do we provide the most cost-effective services uh, for women? How do we get them enrolled and, and plugged into the system? As, as mentioned, uh, we, we, we have the resources, and I think we're going to continue to have resources beyond what we even had last time. The more that we can save and do deliver care uh, in, in, in a very high-quality way, the more the state overall is going to benefit that in, in a number of ways outside of health care. But I think it's important also to remember that uh, the, the laws that were put into place last summer with HB2 uh, were sold as being uh, done to uh, improve the health of women and the safety of women when in fact the uh, Texas Medical Association, the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Texas Hospital Association, and even our state health services did not have any, showed that there was no evidence to support that we needed to make any of those changes. There was no legitimate medical reason to make any of those changes. This was more of, a, of an obstruction of access to a safe and legal procedure. If the law actually limits abortions and doesn't ban it, is there the possibility of funding those clinics to the point where they can do those upgrades to become ambulatory surgical centers? Well, I think that's assuming that we need to do that. And again, I know Dr. Zervas is saying, you know, we look at what's demonstrated and what works. What we had before was demonstrated, had demonstrated its safety and efficacy in, in, in providing this. This was the ambulatory surgical center is uh, a, a, a solution in search of a problem that did not exist. So you, just because something is, uh, has uh, 
wider hallways and, and more bells and whistles doesn't mean that it's necessary for every procedure that's done, especially if it's already a very safe procedure as abortion has been in the clinics that already existed. I think it's also important to remember though that as Dr. Zerwas is talking about, not one penny goes to abortion, not one penny of government dollars goes to abortion. And, and as he said, what started this thing in the previous session with the cuts in family planning was to do kind of what you're talking about, to separate uh, those facilities that had uh, an, an affiliation with uh, a, an abortion provider. So for instance, Planned Parenthood has programs that are not associated at all. They have separate budgets, separate boards that offer uh, women's health care and no abortion. But because they have the same name, because they are connected uh, out in the, in the community, uh, the decision was made by the majority of the legislature I did not agree with to prevent Planned Parenthood from being a part, even though they're a qualified provider, a part of delivering family planning services because of exactly what you're talking about. They provided the preventive care, were not providing the abortions, but they had enough of an association that some people felt that was not appropriate. All right, well you two are on appropriations, so I'm gonna come back and talk to you guys in one year. Great, Terrific. thank you. Great. Thank you, <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. Thanks. Coming up on State of Texas In Depth. The honor that I've had to serve you all over the years will come to an end in uh, December. He'll soon leave office, and he led the Senate during the heated abortion debate. What Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst says could have changed it all, next on this special edition of State of Texas In Depth. I'm Christy Hoppy from the Dallas Morning News. I mean, at that moment, she caught lightning in a bottle and all of a sudden she was a national name. The President of the United States was tweeting about something special happening in Texas. The pressure on her from there to launch a statewide campaign was tremendous. She hasn't yet been able to expand her base and attract the kind of moderate women that she would need. And Hispanics who are largely Catholic, abortion's not a good issue for them too. So she has a lot of reaching out to a lot of different constituencies to come into a competitive race. Welcome back to State of Texas In Depth. Women's health has played a crucial role this campaign season. In the race for governor, Democrat Wendy Davis was the face of the abortion bill filibuster last session. Republican Greg Abbott has led the charge defending the law in court ever since. And for Lieutenant Governor, Democrat Leticia Vandepute became a voice for women that heated night in the Senate one year ago. And for Republican Dan Patrick, the bill only added to his conservative credentials as a candidate. But Patrick had to wait a little longer for his nomination, up against the Republican incumbent David Dewhurst in a contentious primary runoff. As the leader of the Senate, many criticized Dewhurst for losing control of the chamber that night, letting the filibuster play out and giving Democrats a fighting chance in the upcoming election. It is likely part of the reason he won't be returning to his post. I sat down with him to find out what he would change if he could do it all over again. I wouldn't have done anything different other than perhaps have more DPS in the gallery. The whole question was whether or not the senators wanted to break and never have the chance to filibuster again or protect their filibuster right. I got all the Republicans together, asked them if anyone had a different viewpoint, not a soul said anything, including Dan Patrick. So we went out there, broke the filibuster, all hell broke loose, but the point is we passed the bill. And so as a lifelong businessman, I look at the scoreboard and the scoreboard says one for pr protecting women's health and protecting the sanctity of the unborn, and zero for Wendy Davis. Wendy Davis is no longer gonna be in the Texas Senate. Wendy Davis is gonna lose in November, and Republicans are gonna continue, we're gonna grow, and, and be a stronger majority party. That legislation is still playing out in courts today. Where would you like to see the legislature going forward with this topic? The pro-life legislation, HB2, was attacked on two of the four parts, and those two parts have been sustained by the courts. So I view this as an eminently uh, both constitutional and a fair bill. When you look at the different parts, ambulatory surgical centers, 27 other states require ambulatory surgical centers for an abortion. When you look at moving from six months down to five months, 32 other states have earlier termination dates. This is an eminently fair bill. It protects better the health of the mom. So you're not having an abortion in a back room. 
you're having it in an ambulatory surgical center like 27 other states. And again, we're well within the fairway of what other states are doing. Remember, September 1st is the date the full law goes into effect. Then you'll have a chance to weigh in on November 4th, the general election, and the people you put in office will head back to the Capitol on January 13th next year for the 84th Texas Legislative Session. We'll have complete coverage of all of those important events in our political section of KXAN.com. Just search for it under the News tab. Thank you for watching this special edition of State of Texas In-Depth. Join us every Sunday morning at 8.30. I'm Josh Hinkle, and for all of us with the KXAN political team, have a great morning.